Praise God. Don't know if you had a chance to look at your bulletin this morning. It's called Fearfully and Wonderfully Made. The Bible tells us in Psalm 139 that we are fearfully and wonderfully made. Psalm 139, 13 and 14 says, For it was you who created my inward parts. You knit me together in my mother's womb. I will praise you because I have been fearfully and wonderfully made. And fearfully, when translated from the Hebrew language, means with great reverence, heartfelt interest, and with respect. So Jesus said, then the little children were brought to him that he might put his hands on them and pray, but the disciples rebuked them. And Jesus said, let the little children to come to me, and do not forbid them, for such is the kingdom of heaven. And so he laid his hands on them and departed from there. That's in Matthew 19. I like Psalm 127, verse 3. Children are in heritage of the Lord, and the fruit of the womb is God's reward. Praise the Lord. We are God's amazing creation. He makes everything beautiful in his time. Amen? Praise the Lord. Well, I want to share with you this morning, I was up late. <laughs> Developing uh, what God wanted me to say. And first of all, I want to thank all of you for being here today. I realize it's a special day, Mother's Day, and a lot of families have things planned. But God bless you for being in the house of the Lord today. Amen. God will bless you abundantly for that. Uh, I'd like to read Psalm 100 to you. There's a lot of different opinions in our world today. And... Uh, Right now, the Supreme Court is trying to make some decisions where it seems like our country is divided between those who respect God's creation and those who wish to destroy it. So Psalm 100 says, Make a joyful noise unto the Lord, all ye lands. Serve the Lord with gladness. Come before his presence with singing. We've done that today. Know, that, know ye that he is the Lord. He is God. It is he who has made us, and not we ourselves. We are his people and the sheep of his pasture. Enter into his gates with thanksgiving and into his courts with praise. Be thankful unto him and bless his name, for the Lord is good. His mercy is everlasting, and his truth will endure to all generations. I want to read some scriptures to you this morning. You don't need to turn there. I just want you to hear the word of the Lord. Psalm 22.10 said, I was cast upon you, O God, from my birth. From my mother's womb, you have been my God. Psalm 71, verse 5 and 6 says, You are my hope, O Lord God. You are my trust from my youth. By you, I have been sustained from birth. It's God who's kept us. It's God who's helped us. By you I have been sustained from birth. You are he who took me out of my mother's womb. The Apostle Paul said in Galatians chapter 1, verse 15 and 16, But when it pleased God, he separated me from my mother's womb and called me by his grace to reveal his son in me that I might preach him among the heathen. Psalm 139, if you'd turn there with me. Psalm 139. I think the highest thing we can do for people is speak the word of God. Amen? Amen? We can say a lot of words, but God's word is alive. It's full of power. It's sharper than any two-edged sword. It pierces even to the division of our soul and our spirit. And it goes into our joints and our marrow, which brings health, because marrow produces good blood. And it is the discerner or understander of the thoughts and intents of our heart. So God understands us, every single thing about us. In Psalm 139, I want to share with you verses 13 through 18. And I want to read them and then go back over them this morning. The scripture says, For you, O Lord, have possessed my reins, that's my heart, 
and you have covered me in my mother's womb. I will praise you, for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Marvelous are your works, and that my soul knows right well. My substance was not hidden from you when I was made in secret and curiously put together in the lowest parts of the earth. Your eyes did see my substance, yet being unperfect, and in your book all of my parts were written, which in continuance were fashioned, even when there was none of them. How precious are your thoughts to me, O God! How great is the sum of them! If I should count them, they are more in number than the sand. When I awake, I am still with you. Praise God. Father, I just want to ask this morning as we share your word, I pray, Holy Spirit, that you will speak through me. And I pray today, Lord, that as even people will be listening on YouTube and others who aren't present here this morning, that the word of God would penetrate our hearts, that we would truly see and understand that it is all about you. By him, all things were created. By him, all things were sustained. By our God, we continue to go forward in life. And in death, we have the promise of eternal life. If we believe in the Lord Jesus Christ, who was crucified for our sins and was buried and rose from the dead the third day to give us hope for eternal life. In those promises we stand today, Father, and ask that you bless this service in Jesus' name and all of your people. Amen and amen. And God bless you. Psalm 139, verse 13 tells us that God sheltered me in my mother's womb. God sheltered me. He surrounded me. He enfolded me. So in Psalm 91, that's uh, brought forth in a little, little bit more clear perspective. Psalm 91 verse 1 says, He who dwells in the secret place of the Most High will abide under the shadow of the Almighty. And one of the things I've learned about shadows is you have to be directly over something in order to have your shadow over it. So while we were in our mother's womb, God's hand was over us. His shadow was over us. He that dwells in the secret place of the Most High will abide under the shadow of the Almighty. Verse 2, I will say of the Lord, He is my refuge. Refuge means hiding place. He is my refuge. He is my fortress. He is my God. In Him will I trust. Surely He will deliver you from the snare of the fowler and from the noisome pestilence. God talks about the tricks that the enemy tries to pull on God's children. He says he'll deliver you from that. And from the noise and pestilence. All the threats of new diseases coming upon the earth. God says, I'll deliver you from that. I don't even listen to that junk anymore. Because you know what? I am fully vaccinated by the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. And so are you. Amen? Praise God. There is no higher vaccination than the blood of Jesus Christ, our Lord. Verse 4, he will cover you with his feathers, and under his wings will you trust, and his truth will be your shield and your buckler. You know, I often wondered through the years, what is a buckler? I know what a shield is, but what's a buckler? So a shield was held by a person who was going out to war. He went before him, and if you've ever read the story of uh, 1 Samuel 17 of Goliath, you'll see that a shield bearer went before Goliath. So he had this big shield, and you wonder, well, what's that about? Well, when, when the enemy would sling arrows or throw spears, that shield bearer would hold up the shield and deflect them from the warrior who was coming forth. And what's the buckler? The buckler is a little shield. It's the shield that warriors held, if you're right-handed, held in their left hand, and then the sword in their right hand. So... All the arrows and the spears are deflected because God is our shield. God deflects them from us. And then we have a buckler. We're called into war. 
He says that we put on the whole armor of God that we may be able to stand in the evil day and having done all to stand. Having put on, you know, the breastplate of righteousness and the, the helmet of salvation and, and the breastplate of righteousness and the shield of faith and the sword of the Spirit and our feet shod with the uh, gospel, the preparation of the gospel of peace. So God gives us these instruments of war to fight against the enemy of our soul. And he promises us in Psalm 91 that he will protect us. And then Psalm 17, verses 8 and 9. Psalm 17, verse 8 and 9. Tells us, keep me as the apple of your eye, Lord. Hide me under the shadow of your wings. From the wicked who oppress me. From my deadly enemies who compass me about. And so... We are in a war. Our society is in a war. And I feel that that war is also against mothers. Against women who want to have children, but are told, you don't necessarily have to keep that child. So in verse 14, we need to understand that we are fearfully and wonderfully made. The word fearfully, again, translated from the Hebrew means formed with great reverence. So if you can imagine God forming your inward parts in your mother's womb, when yet there were none of them, when, when the doctor's tools couldn't see what you looked like, God knew exactly what you looked like. God knew exactly what your life would be. God had a plan for you. Jeremiah 29, 11 says, I know the plans that I have for your life, says the Lord. They are plans for good and not for evil, to give you a future and an expected end. And then God says, and then you will go to pray to me, and I will listen to you. And you will pray and seek my face, and you will find me when you search for me with your whole heart. And in verse 15, he says, all my parts were hidden from you. So my bones... Uh, or all my parts were not hidden from you. My bones were not hidden from God. I was made with great skill in my mother's womb. I want to read you a scripture here out of the book of Ecclesiastes. I found this one last night. Sure, many of you have read it over and over, but this is an amazing verse. Ecclesiastes 11, verse 5. As you know not what is the way of the Spirit nor how the bones grow in the womb of her who is with child. Even so, you do not know all the works of God who makes everything. So one of the things we need to understand in our world today is that God is at work. And God has chosen mothers to do His work in. He's chosen mothers to do that work in. None of us would be here without a mom. Amen. Verse 16 the scripture tells us, your eyes, God, saw my substance, being yet unformed. And in your book, all of my parts were written, and the days were fashioned for me, even when there were yet none of them. God saw into the future and saw each one of our lives as they were being formed. And you know, I've wondered in our country with all the things that have come against mothers, gee, I wonder if the child who had the cure for cancer was taken away before he had a chance to be born. I'm wondering if the young lady who had an opportunity to write spiritual songs was taken away before she had the choice to be born. And I want you to know there is forgiveness with God. I've talked to several Christian women who when they were not saved had that abortion. And they've had a difficult time dealing with the fact that they had one. But there is forgiveness at the cross. Jesus said, come unto me, all ye that are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn of me, for I am meek and lowly in heart. You will find rest unto your souls. We can find rest in Jesus. There's no one here that isn't, hasn't done sin in their life. We've all sinned and come short of the glory of God. But there's forgiveness at the cross of Jesus Christ. The Bible tells us, For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son, that whosoever believes in Him, whosoever believes in Him, shall not perish but have everlasting life. 
Because God didn't send his son into the world to condemn the world, but that through him, the world might be saved. And God wants to save people. He wants people to come to Christ. Ecclesiastes 3.11 says God will make everything beautiful in his time. And he will. Sometimes I think we look at our life and say, I wish I would have done this differently. I wish I would have done that differently. I wish this wouldn't have happened. I wish that wouldn't have happened. But you know God gives us that promise. All things work together for good. We've talked about this before. All things. Good things. Bad things. Happy things. Sad things. Hard things. Easy things. Pleasant things. Unpleasant things. All things work together for good to those who love the Lord and those who are the called according to his purpose. If you've ever been to Hawaii, you see these skinny little trees with a little puff on top, palm trees. And you wonder, how in the world do they, uh, they weather those storms, those big storms that literally bend them almost in half? How do they weather that? And when I asked one of the natives there in Hawaii, how does that happen? He said, if you were to dig under in, into the sand with these trees, their roots go way out. And so when those storms come, those roots hold them to spring back into life. And you know, when our roots spread out with God, when our roots spread out into God's word and into fellowship with other believers, and our roots spread out in proclaiming the kingdom of God, God holds us strong against all the storms that can come against us. Amen. Verses 17 and 18 says, we're always on God's mind. You know, I wish I could say God is always on my mind. Sometimes there's other things on my mind. There's things that distract me in this world. But God says, you are always on my mind. You're always on my mind. God thinks about us in his thoughts. If we were able to count the sands of the sea, he thinks about each and every one of us every second of every day of our entire life. God is always thinking about you. God is always thinking about me. So with all these promises, God has trusted mothers to bring forth this creation. And if you study the attributes of the Holy Spirit... Comforter, teacher, guide, encourager, the one who calms you in your tears. That's what the Holy Spirit does. So God gave the attributes of the Holy Spirit to moms. Isaiah 49.1 says, listen to me, coastlands. Listen, you people from afar. The Lord has called me from the womb. From the inward parts of my mother, he has made mention of my name. You know, I've often wondered about mothers when their children go astray. And I certainly went astray. My mother loved me no matter what I did. And for, for men, it's a little bit difficult sometimes for us to understand. Man, that child needs discipline. You know, and the mother will protect Watch over, doesn't matter what the child does, that mother has the unconditional love of God for that child. That helps us to understand moms. So praise the Lord for his goodness to us. He's given us mothers to care for us. And I want to tell you about a mother's heart. I'm not going to be long today. Because I want to respect the time that you want to spend with your mothers. My mother, my physical mother, has been in heaven since I was 27 years old. But God has blessed me with so many moms, it's incredible. You know, the scripture says, if, you, uh, if your father and mother leave you, then the Lord will take you up. And when I was really young, both my parents passed away. So, I have had fathers in the Lord. And mothers in the Lord, ever since I came to Jesus, I've got so many moms who love me and care for me and watch over me. And uh, I just think it's awesome that God takes care of us. The scripture says, whoever forsakes houses and lands and children 
and mothers and fathers for my name's sake in the gospel. In this life, he shall receive 100-fold mothers and brothers and sisters and fathers. And in the life to come, eternal life. So God promises us that he will mother us. And he does that through the Holy Spirit. And he does that sometimes with people with skin on them too. Amen? Amen. So I want to share with you a mother's heart. This mother who loves the Lord writes, When my children were small, I never wanted them out of my sight. I kept them so close. I endeavored to build into them a confidence that I would always be there for them. Beginning with that first step at around one year old, when a mom has that sense of uneasiness, that already their child is beginning to move away from her. I sensed it. It was like any other mom when their adorable child takes their first step. You feel like they are the smartest kid in the world. But deep down is this feeling of dread that each new, new day in their young lives, they will move a little bit further away from me until one day, God forbid, they will leave and start a life without me somewhere else. So my determination became to teach them about Jesus every chance I could. I would not leave it up to their Sunday school teachers, Christian school teachers, or anyone else to do my job of bringing my kids to Christ and to the best of my ability to teach them how to live by living that way myself. I wanted them to know that whatever came into their life, they would always have Him the Lord, and he would direct their paths and be their constant companion. So when my daughter was four, we lost her mother, and we were all alone. There were no relatives here that would take care of her, just me. Now, I was blessed to have a mom in the Lord, Barbara Hall, who uh, had nine children and ten with Christina, and you would take her into your home and let her play with your daughters. And uh, she helped me care for my daughter. But I wanted her to know God more than anything else in the world. So I want to tell you a couple of things before I go on with this story. First of all, I wanted her to know she'd never be alone. So I taught her and helped her to memorize when she was three years old, John chapter 10, verses 27 through 30. And it says, my sheep hear my voice. And I know them, and they will follow me. And I will give unto them eternal life. They will never perish. Neither will anyone pluck them out of my hand. For my Father who gave them to me is greater than all, and no man is able to pluck them out of my Father's hand, for I and my Father are one. And that was, those are the very first Bible verses that Christina memorized to know that she would never be alone. And then despite the counsel from others, I taught her the book of Revelation. You say, what in the world would you teach your kid the book of Revelation for? Because I wanted her to know, in case something happened to me, don't you dare fall for the world's lies. This is exactly what's going to happen at the end of the world. I will always be here for you. But if I somehow can't be here for you, our God will be here for you. And he will protect you. And so when she was about six years old, uh, her school, she was in a Christian school, uh, they took them down to Santa Barbara for a trip to the zoo. And so they loaded up in the bus and I packed her little lunch for her and they all went down to Santa Barbara and, and they got there and uh, they returned about three o'clock in the afternoon and I was in the parking lot to pick her up when they parked the bus and the school principal said, I went over and I said, yeah, what, what's going on? And he goes, can I talk to you about your daughter? And I said, sure. And he said, uh, when we got to the zoo, they stamped the little children. They stamped them so they'd know which kids belonged to which school. And your daughter said, that's not going to happen. <laughs> and, and they said, no, 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 this is, this is okay. And she said, I'm not taking any stamps, no marks, nothing. 
And so <laughs> this little six-year-old girl fought off the school principal and her teacher until they finally conceded to her. And praise God, she's a strong woman now. She's 38 years old. But they pinned a little tag on her with the name of the school <laughs> and her name. And then she, she said, I don't need to see animals. I, I see them all the time. And they, they said, no, no, you have, we can't leave you out here. And so finally they gave her the little sign and in she went. It's a mom's determination to protect her children. Amen? And God gave me the opportunity to feel some feelings that a mother feels. And I believe that every pastor has to have those kind of feelings for the sheep, God's sheep, that he puts uh, for, the, for, for them to take care of and help and encourage. And, and I thank God for that in my life when we sang that song, all of the things that happened in my past, all of the burdens, all of the cares. I thank God for all of those because it helped prepare me for what I do now. Amen? She writes, my determination became to teach them about Jesus every chance I could. I would not leave it up to their Sunday school teachers, their Christian school teachers, or anyone else to do my job of bringing my kids to Christ to the best of my ability and teach them how to live as I lived that way. I wanted them to know that whatever came into their life, they would always have the Lord and he would always direct their paths and, their, and be their constant companion. So they both came to me at around four to five years old, she writes, and asked if I would pray with them to invite Jesus into their lives. What a joyous day that was. So then they started school, and this is how it went. Kindergarten and first grade, when they would return to me at the end of their day, they were always full of joy to see me, happy to see me. We always had a snack together, and they would play and then rest. And I would tell them, I am so, so glad that you were home. And I really meant it. Now the following years came and went with each new year, they grew a little more independent. <laughs> I remember when my daughter turned eight. And we were sitting at the breakfast table and she said something to me and I said, what? And I could tell that she was moving away. I could tell that she was growing. I could tell that she was becoming an independent person. And it was like my little baby girl had turned the corner. And you moms know exactly what I'm talking about. Now the following years came and went. With each new year, they grew a little more independent. At first, they wanted to be where they could see me, but not too hovering or clingy. Every day when they would come home, the instant they opened the door, they always said, Mom, I'm home. And I would again breathe easy once again because my children were mine again for at least that day. Then came junior high school. <laughs> I'm in a park right there. <laughs> so many things. Glitter all over my car. You know, I was an investigator at the time. And I'd go in to take a statement. I'd have glitter. You know, I'd, I'd rub my face and then I'd have glitter on my eyes. And ah, I had to let that one go. You got to pick your fights. Then it was the two strings of hair in front of the eyes. And I wanted to sneak in at night, take my knife and just cut those off, you know. <laughs> but I had a neighbor who advised me, just pick, pick your battles. Don't, it'll go away in a few weeks. And it did. And there were so many things in junior high. She writes, then came junior high school, the time when I became an embarrassment to them, if they were seen with me in front of their friends. <laughs> and the time when you wonder if aliens have inhabited your children. <laughs> One day they get up and they even look different. Then they open their mouths and you know for sure, this isn't my child. And a part of you grieves. You know that your children are not babies anymore. That time has passed. But wait, they still come home at the end of the day. And they yell, hey mom, I'm home. And for a moment, all is well with the world again. 
And then high school comes. I could see they were becoming more independent with each passing grade. But still they came home at the end of the day. And at some point I would always hear, Mom, I'm home. And for a brief moment I closed my eyes. And I hung on to those sweet memories once again. Then they left. They flew out of the nest. And oh, it was so painful to let my babies go. So I'll tell you another story. So when Christina was 18, she said, Dad, I, I want to go to beauty school. I want to learn how to do manicures and some other things. And I said, okay, so... I helped her with that, helped her get into school, and then she said, I think I, I want to move. I said, where are we going to move to? And she said, no, just I want to move. <laughs> and if I was from New York, I would have said, you're talking to me. <laughs> you know? And I said, where do you want to move to? And she said, I found a really cool little apartment down by St. Mary's Catholic Church. It's a little tiny house. They're not much every month. And now that, now that I'm working two jobs, I, I want to be on my own. So I helped her with some furniture and some other things and got her all moved in. And that was the last time I ever had to help her. She's bought her own home, bought her own vehicles, paid her own way. Uh, if I didn't do much right, I did that right anyway. I taught her to be independent because I didn't know how long I would be around. And I wanted her to be secure in this world with the Lord. And so one night she called me. It's about 1130. She said, Dad, somebody's outside my window. I was in the car with my pistol in two seconds. <laughs> Boom, driving down the freeway. I got there and I'm walking all around the house. Whoever's there is going to get it. And nobody was there. And I knocked on the door and she opened the door and said, Dad, put the gun down. <laughs> I went in and we sat up till about four in the morning just laughing and talking and watching a movie together those kind of memories you can't buy those you can't buy those memories and I encourage some of you that have young children man they 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 grow fast you know my my little grandkids are not little anymore my my littlest granddaughter is now six, and every time I see her, she's a little bit taller. My grandson that I used to play with all the time is now a Marine in Okinawa. I have a granddaughter who's working to be a forest ranger in Northern California, and another one who works in Pismo Beach, and it's just amazing how fast they grow. So parents take advantage of the time that you have when they're little. Take advantage of the time to spend with them. Because you won't get those memories back. You, you won't get those times back. So she writes, they left. And they flew out of the nest. And oh, it was so painful to let my babies go. And all of you parents out there who have had kids leave, you know exactly what she's talking about. There's a hole left in your heart that it takes a little while to figure out how to function again without your kids always being in the back of your mind and whatever you're doing, how it might affect them. They have their own life now. But then they would come back to see me once, once and again, and I heard that welcome phrase when they would walk in the door and say, Mom, I'm home. And I realized... At that point, that to them, it was not where I lived that was their home. It was the fact that home is where I am. Amen? Amen. It's really hard for me to read this. This last part is amazing. And it's really the brunt of my message this morning that the most important thing in this life is to make sure that your children know Jesus. 
that is the absolute most important thing in this world, is to make sure that your loved ones are going to be there with you. That is the primary thing on this earth. They're not always going to act right. There'll be times that they embarrass you. There'll be times that you embarrass them. There'll be times that you wish they would have done something different. But when eternity comes, there's that one opportunity that we have to lead them to Jesus. To make sure that they know Christ above everything else. So she writes, as she ends her story, One day my life here on earth will be through. And then I will be with Jesus in heaven. My vision has always been that on a given day, when I'm in heaven, as I'm going about whatever tasks God has for me, that suddenly, everything will stop for me. Suddenly, there will be an awareness that will fill my being that something wonderful is about to happen. And then I will hear it oh so clearly. The voice of my children is as familiar as my own voice. And I will hear on heaven's shore. Mom, I'm home. Home, meaning now our real home in heaven, where we were always meant to be. Father, I pray today that not only the moms, but us who are dads will understand that the most important thing in this life is to make sure that those who you've entrusted to us know you as Lord and Savior. You tell us in Psalm 127 and verse 3, children are in heritage of the Lord. And the fruit of the womb is God's reward. Happy is the man who has his quiver full of them. For they shall fight with the enemy in the gates. And Lord, I thank you for the privilege of all the mothers who are in here today who have heard this message. Because the message is, Children are a gift from God. And if we look at it from your point of view, Lord, you trusted mothers to bring these precious children that you said, for of such are the kingdom of heaven. And so, Lord, I pray that the foremost thing in our mind and our hearts today, both moms and dads, would be to make sure that our children, no matter what age they are, it's never too late to teach them about Jesus. Father, I realize that some of us have children that are grown. And yet, Lord, our responsibility is to be accountable to you and tell them about Jesus the King of kings and the Lord of lords, the one who we will all face when we close our eyes and take our last breath, our Father which is in heaven, hallowed be thy name, O Lord. Hallowed be thy name. I pray thy kingdom come. Thy will will be done on earth as it is in heaven. I pray today, Father God, for my brothers and sisters in Christ and for myself 
Someday, Father, I may have the privilege of being a great-grandpa. Others will already have that privilege of being great-grandparents. Grandparents, parents. Let us not take that responsibility lightly, Lord. I ask in the name of Jesus that if there's anyone within the sound of my voice, including on YouTube, that has aught against their children, that it would be forgiven here and now today. Because, Lord, eternity is far too long for us to hold on to unforgiveness or bitterness. Father, I pray for forgiveness for all of us who made mistakes while we were raising our children. I pray for forgiveness, Lord. And I thank you for your merciful graciousness to allow us to continue to minister to them until the day when we take our last breath. And that when that day comes, when we are in glory with you, May we hear that sound, I'm home. And may we rejoice for eternity with those precious babies that you allowed us to have the privilege of raising on this earth. Father, we give you praise and we give you glory today for all of your goodness in our lives. I thank you for your word, Father. I thank you, Father, for your goodness in our life. And Lord, I recite your word back to you. I will extol you, my God and my King. I will bless your name forever. Every day will I bless you. I will praise your name forever. Great is the Lord and greatly to be praised. His greatness is unsearchable. For we know, Lord, that one generation will praise your works to another, and they will declare your mighty acts. So we will speak of the glorious honor of your majesty and of your wondrous works. And we will speak of the might of your wonderful acts and declare your greatness. And we will utter the memory of your great goodness and will sing of your righteousness. For you, Lord, are gracious and you are full of compassion. You are slow to anger and of great mercy. You are good to all and your tender mercies are over all of your works. And all of your works will praise you, O Lord. And we, your saints, will bless you. For we will speak of the glory of your kingdom and talk of your power to make known to the children of men your mighty acts and the glorious majesty of your kingdom. Because, Father, your kingdom is an everlasting kingdom and your dominion endures throughout all generations. You uphold all those who fall and you raise up all those who are bowed down. And the eyes of all that wait upon you you will give them their needs in due season. For you open your hand and satisfy the desire of every living thing, Father. You were righteous in all of your ways and holy in all of your works. You were near unto all of us who call upon you, those of us who call upon you in truth. And you will fulfill the desires of all of us who fear you. You will also hear our cry and you will save us for Lord you preserve all those who love you and our mouth shall speak the praise of the Lord so let all flesh bless your holy name forever and ever I pray a blessing over your people today I pray that these words have reached our hearts and that you will help us, Lord, to accomplish your will on this earth as it is in heaven. 
I ask now, Father, that you bless this congregation as we depart today to celebrate this Mother's Day. We celebrate you, Lord, and we give you all glory and praise in Jesus' holy name. And all of God's people said, Amen, and God bless you, church. You are dismissed today. I pray you'll have a very, very blessed day today. In Jesus' name, amen. You were wounded for our transgression. You were bruised for our iniquity. Punishment that was due for our peace was laid on you. By